Last Sunday, as it connected with Father's Day, maybe if you were here, you'll, you'll remember this. I'm just going to briefly hit a couple things. We talked about the life of Obed-Edom and how Obed-Edom was someone who wanted the presence of God in his life. And when David brought the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God, he came back three months later to take it back to Jerusalem. And Obed-Edom says, whoa, 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 hold on. Wherever that box goes is where I'm going to go because I'm not living without the presence of God in my life. Awesome thing. What a great example that is for us, that, that today we, we have that same thought process. I am not living without the presence of God in my life. But I, I also want to take that a step further today. We're not really going to talk a lot about Obed-Edom. I just want to bring up a little bit of, of this as it relates to what we're talking about this morning. Obed-Edom, when he left and he started following the Ark of the Covenant, he, when that, that presence of God in his life, I want you to notice as you continue to read uh, Second Chronicles and such that he did not just sit down and look at that ark all day. Man, I want to be in God's presence. I'm just going to sit down and soak all this in. Right? No, what did he do? He served. He served. The Bible says that he became a gatekeeper. He didn't rescue the princess from the fiery dragon. He didn't, oh, he didn't uh, do incredible feats of war and those kind of things. He was a gatekeeper. Do you know what gatekeepers do? They open gates. It's not a prestigious position. It's not something that probably got him a lot of fame and notoriety. But he was someone at the gate. And when someone came in, he opened the gate. That's what he did. Why? Because he was willing to serve. He was willing to serve. I want to challenge you with this thought today. I believe that serving is a spiritual discipline. A lot of times we, we understand when we, we talk about spiritual disciplines, and these are spiritual disciplines when we talk about reading your Bible, and we, we talk about praying, we talk about those kind of things, giving of your, of your tithe, those kind of things. Those are spiritual disciplines. But I also want to challenge your thought that says serving is also a spiritual discipline. When you serve as unto the Lord, Webster defines serving as this, to perform duties or services for another person or organization. To perform duties or services for another person or organization. He defines servant as this, a person who performs duties for others, devoted and helpful follower or supporter. The idea of being a servant of God. If you were to look at New Testament scripture, especially when they wrote books in the New Testament, you know, when you write a letter, you usually write who it's to, and then at the end of the letter, you write who it's from, right? Don't send anonymous letters, that's not nice. So you write who it's from. In the New Testament, the way that they did it is they wrote who it was from in the beginning. One thing that you'll notice as you read the letters that Paul wrote, the letters of Peter, the, the letters of John, those things that, that were mentioned in this text, the things that you'll see is this. It'll say, Paul, a servant of God. A slave of God. Why is that? Because he wanted you to know that it wasn't just Paul's words. It wasn't meant to glorify him. He's just in a position to be used. So this thought process comes to my mind, is it possible to love God and not be a servant? Is it possible to love God and not really care about other people? Jesus said this. He said that, how do, you, how do we know that we love God? Because he said that you'll love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And then he said this. This is the second one, and it's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the only way that you can love your neighbor is to serve one another. It's a continual thing that you'll see throughout Scripture, this idea of servanthood. Jesus didn't model any kind of lifestyle that wasn't a servant. It wasn't what he preached, it wasn't what he practiced, and it sure wasn't what he proclaimed. 
There are many passages in Scripture that we could look at. Time won't afford us that luxury, but I've selected three today that I want us to go to. The first one is found in Mark chapter 10. Before we go to read, I want to kind of set this up a little bit for you. If you look a little bit before verse 35, which is where we're going, you'll find a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and just says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus begins to tell him, hey, you know the commandments, uh, don't commit adultery. He goes through all of those, and he answers this question. I can just see this rich young ruler thinking, ching, got that. And he goes, yeah, I've done all these things. And Jesus looked at him. And one thing I, I, I didn't mention in the first service, it's found in verse 21. It says this, Jesus looked at him, he loved him. And this is a side note. Let me just tell you this. People need to love you enough to tell you the truth. You missed a great opportunity right there. Jesus tells this guy the truth. He told him where he was. And he says, listen, this is what you lack. He's a wealthy guy. He says, go and sell everything you have. And then come follow me. Take up the cross and follow me. The Bible says that this guy turned away because he was saddened by that word. And so he went away discouraged. It wasn't the fact that stuff is bad as long as the stuff doesn't have you. See, the stuff had this guy's heart. His heart was consumed with his stuff. And truly to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you are, have to be the place where your stuff is not consuming you. Jesus is consuming you. And when Jesus consumes you, then the next phase of that is you're going to serve others. You're going to love other people. As you continue on this, the, the disciples were kind of befuddled a little bit, and they're, they're looking at this and like, man, who can be saved? Who can be saved? And Jesus gives them an answer with men, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And, and Peter says this, and, and this is significant. He says, look, we've left everything. Kind of like the rich young ruler, he wouldn't leave that stuff. But Jesus, we got it right. We left everything and have followed you. We've done the right thing. And Jesus begins to tell them, um, a, a, about what that looks like for eternity. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Not three verses later, two disciples come to Jesus. And that's where we pick up the story, okay? So you're kind of getting this kind of thought process, all right? Two disciples come to Jesus. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want that whatever we may ask you would do for us. Isn't that a loaded question? If you have kids, and they come up to you and say, we want you to do whatever we ask, how many of you know that's a loaded question? <laughs> like, okay, what's going on, right? Something's broke, it's about to be broke, or you're wanting something that you ain't getting. Those are usually the three things that come to my mind when that question gets asked. And Jesus responds, and he says this, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Verse 37, they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? They said to him, we can. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they, became, they began to be very displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are appointed to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And, who, and whoever among you would be greatest must be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Father, today I, I pray, move in our hearts this morning. Move in us, Jesus, that we may be able to hear what you want us to hear. I thank you, Lord, today. Help us to be closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. He pulls the 12 aside, and basically after Peter's proclamation in, in, in verse 28, says, look, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus tells him, hey, the last are going to be first, and the first are going to be last. And then he gives this whole thought process that says, listen, I'm about to leave. I'm about to die. I'm going to be resurrected, and I'm going to, I'm going to leave. They're going to scourge him, but three days he's going to rise. The disciples never really got that concept. And you ask, Pastor, how, Joe, how do you know that? Because if they got that concept, James and John would not have asked that question. Have you ever listened to somebody, but you're not really listening? Don't, don't raise your hand, husbands. This is, this is not the time for you to do that. All right? Or you have spoken to someone and, and they're not really listening, but you're still talking and, they're, and you just kind of get that glazed over look. And, and I can just see these disciples, they've got that glazed over look and Jesus is telling them, listen, I'm going to die. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be put to death. But after three days, I'm going to rise again. And they're just like, oh, okay. By the way, can I sit at your right hand or your left hand in the kingdom? That's not a logical question at this point. It speaks to the fact that they didn't understand or hear what was going on. James and John come with this request, and can you just imagine for a moment what the other, people, what the other disciples were thinking as they heard it? They could have been thinking a couple things. Number one, they could have been thinking, oh, I wish I'd have thought of that first. <sighs> Those guys are always thinking ahead of me, right? The Bible says that they were very displeased. One version will say they were very indignant. <laughs> indignant means that you're feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what was perceived as unfair treatment. You're thinking, man, these guys, the gall of these guys to ask to be in that position. Jesus just told us that the first will be last. And the last will be first. I didn't get up in the line fast enough. I took that literally. James and John asked that question. But I love his reply. He reiterates a lot of what he said earlier, but he does it in a different way. And that's where we're going to spend some of our time today in this. The first thing that he reiterates here is this, that the kingdom of God is not about power, prestige or position. Let's say that again. The kingdom of God is not about power, prestige, or position. It's about being a servant, and it's about sacrifice. Can I sit in a position of honor and authority? That's what they're asking for. Jesus had just told them in chapter 9 that, in chapter 10 that the first will be last, and the last will be first. And they're just like, man, what is going on? You see, God's kingdom is different than the world thinks. God's kingdom is not whether we can rise to the top. God's kingdom is about how we can love and serve one another where we are. There should be no real thoughts of advancing here. You know, I think sometimes we carry worldly values into kingdom principles. When I signed on to be a youth pastor many moons ago, I never looked at that as a stepping stone. I never thought, well, bless God, I've got my life planned out. I'm going to be at this church for two years, and then I'm going to move. And I'm going to move up in the ladder, and I'm going to be at this church for a couple years, and I'm going to move again. And God's going to just keep moving me up and up and up and up. And that's the position climbing that ladder of success. That's not kingdom principles. I learned a long time ago, this is my thought process. Whenever I come to a place of ministry, whether that's here at Bisville, whether that was in any of the youth ministry positions that I took, my philosophy of ministry was this. I am here until Jesus comes. 
or until he calls me somewhere else. It's not a stepping stone. There are no positions of authority, of, of being, as far as authority, being places where we use them as, as places where we get prestige and power and position. That's not what this is about. And we've brought worldly concepts into kingdom principles. It's not about advancing. It's about serving one another. That's totally backward to the way that the world thinks. I think that's true because the devil likes to think, keep things stirred up. Have you ever noticed that in your life? The devil likes to stir the pot. All of a sudden somebody says something and it kind of rubs you the wrong way and you're like it's in your crawl for like days. He's stirring the pot. They got a promotion I didn't. Stirring the pot. Oh, Pastor, called, Pastor Black called them to the pray for the offering. You can call on me. Some of you are up here praying, God, don't let him call on me, please. Jesus, don't. Right? It's not about power and prestige or position. It's about servanthood and sacrifice. We are constantly looking for ways to jump the line instead of serving the people in it. We try to get ahead, whatever it costs. And when you climb this ladder, whether it be in the world or in the church, you're going to find some principles here. When you climb the ladder because you think it's a thing of power and prestige, you're going to find that it breeds loneliness. You've heard the saying, it's lonely at the top. You know why it's lonely at the top? Because you pushed everybody out of the way to get there. You're going to find disharmony. We see that in this passage of Scripture. The other disciples, man, they are ticked off. To say that they were very displeased and indignant, that's a nice way to say they were super upset. Because you see, you will not have peace and harmony where pride and power are present. There's distrust there. You can't trust anyone because you're so concerned about their motives. There's pain that's involved. You're going to get hurt along the way or you're going to hurt other people. There's pain involved in this setting. But Jesus says that's not the way of the kingdom. The kingdom mindset is that we do this thing together, not alone. The kingdom mindset is that we are in one accord and we have unity and we're always thinking of the other person first. The kingdom mindset is that we live in peace with each other, that we have each other's back, that we trust one another. The kingdom mindset is that we are to bandage wounds, not cause them. That's what the kingdom's about. It's not about power, prestige, or position. It's about servanthood and sacrifice. Next thing I notice about this passage of Scripture is this, that Jesus came to serve. Mark 10, 45 is probably the central theme for the entire gospel of Mark. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to serve, to be served. He came to serve. Think about that for a minute. If anybody had the right to come and be served, it was Jesus. If anybody had the right to come and require servants to come and, and to bring him things and to bless him and to do all of these things for him, it would have been him. But he didn't do that. Why? Because he's modeling for us the way to live. That is not about the, the people that come and, and bring you stuff. It's about giving of yourself. A lot of times we view church and we view, view this thought process of, of the church as what can I get? Church was never meant to be that way. Kingdom principles are not meant to be that way. Church is not about what you can get. It's about what you can give. 
It's not just about sitting in a pew every week and and praising God and and liking the songs and and liking the sermon and and coming and coming together. Man, I like the fellowship time and the aspects of that. All of that's good, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, so many times we've become a consumer-based religious entity. What happens if... All of a sudden, you go to Burger King and you can't have it your way anymore. What are you doing? You're going to Wendy's. Isn't that true? Come on. Don't look at me like I'm weird. If you go to Burger King and they mess up your order, the first time you might forgive them a little bit. If they put onions on your hamburger, demons spit on your hamburger. They may forgive you a little bit. You may forgive them for the first time. If they do it repeatedly, how many of you know you're not going to Burger King anymore? You're going to Wendy's until they do something that you don't like. Come on now. You know I'm speaking truth. We take the same thought process to the church house. And if somebody does something that I don't like, we don't look at it as, well, church is supposed to be something I'm, I'm receiving, I'm getting. And what we have come up with in our society is a bunch of fat Christians who sit in their pew and do nothing. Oh, <laughs> bless God. Because we've got this consumer-based attitude that it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I need. And when you have that kind of attitude, can I just throw this out there? I've done it earlier today. I might as well keep going, right? I'm going to throw this out there. You will never be satisfied in any church if you have a what can I get mentality. You will never come to grips with, uh, because the devil will make sure that you're always offended. He'll make sure you're always being hurt. He'll make sure always something's going wrong because he doesn't want you to find out that someday when you switch your mentality and say, well, church shouldn't be about what I can get. It's about what I can give because when you do that, it changes your heart. It changes your life. It changes your focus. And we become so consumer-based that when we come to the body of Christ, all we really want to do is come back and enjoy it and have it our way. And we sit back and we take in, but we're not giving out. And we've become lethargic. You know what lethargic is? My basketball coach told me that word lethargic. It's really just being lazy. Because we think that this is all about me. Church, let me just tell you this. Church will never ever be about you. It must always be about him. It must always be about serving him. And if you come in with this attitude that says, it's about what I can get, not what I can give, you're going to find yourself very disappointed. You're going to find yourself in a place of frustration. Disciples kind of had that mentality. Oh, it's about me. I want to be, the, I want, I want to be on your right hand. I want to be on your left because those are positions of honor. It's about what I can get. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Hold on a second. I didn't come to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. To give my life. You know, when I was in Bible college, we had this... Uh, Organizations called CMF. It meant Campus Missions Fellowship, and they met every Friday night. And whenever I was able to make it, I, I would go. And, and typically, whenever you went to Campus Missions Fellowship, it was usually the same thing. They were going to challenge you to go to Africa. They're going to challenge you to give more money than you could, and they're going to challenge you to pray. That's what missions is about: giving, going, and, and giving, going, and praying. Yeah. But there was one service that I sat in, and this guy had a different philosophy. And he went to this passage of Scripture that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And and he he said this thought, and it stuck with me. He said, 
He came to give his life. And if I'm going to be Christ-like, and I'm going to do what Christ wants me to do, the alternative of that for me is that I must give my life in return. So I'm going to give my life to him because I want to, in turn, serve him. Follow me on that. That it's not just about what I want. I'm going to lay my life down and say, Jesus, whatever you have for me, whatever you want from me, I am completely and totally yours. Romans 12.1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. How many of you know sacrifices are dead? A living sacrifice, that's the difference there. You're still breathing, but you've sacrificed your life. It's an oxymoron. It's kind of like fun run. It's an oxymoron. There's nothing fun about running. It's like Microsoft works. That's an oxymoron. Microsoft never works. When we serve one another, we model, and we serve our community, and we serve our church, we serve our families, we model, and we give, we model the life and purposes of Christ. After all, I'm supposed to be becoming more like him. I'm supposed to be becoming more like him. You know, when you serve, can I just tell you this? It's not based on your social or economic status. It's not based on whether you have or you have not. We're still called to serve others. You know, it's also not based on age. It's not based on age. Some of the most important things, I, I've seen children come up, one of the most powerful things is I've seen children come up and put their hands on their parents or on their grandparents or on someone and they just pray over them. My goodness, that's powerful. But it's not just for the young, it's for the old. Can I just throw this out? There's no retirement plan for you. The retirement plan is this. One day, you're going to have an appointment. <laughs> and that appointment will be that you get to meet Jesus. And it's an appointment that every last one of us in this room is going to make. That's the day your retirement kicks in. So if you're waiting on some 401k, some wonderful thing that kind of goes out and let you have a condo on the beach somewhere. Let me just tell you, as long as he gives you breath, you are supposed to serve. There's no retirement plan. God's no respecter of persons. Abraham was 99 years old when he had Isaac. 99. I don't even see any 99-year-old people in the room today. Those of you that are pushing 99, could you imagine... Moses was 80, at least 80 years old, when the burning bush happened. And God tells him to go to Egypt. I think of, on the other spectrum of that, David was a teenager when God called him and anointed him to be king. And he slew the giant. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were teenagers, young men. And God used them, and he told them, and they went to the fiery furnace for their faith because it wasn't just about what they could get. All of the other Jewish people in the land was about, oh, I'm not going to ruffle any feathers. I'm not going to cause any waves. And when the music blew and the statue was in front of them, they bowed down to worship, but not these three guys because they were serving the Lord. As long as we have breath, God's called you to serve him and to serve people. There are two other passages of scripture that I, I want to hit quickly. I spent a little bit more time on those than I wanted to on that one, but that's okay. I feel like the Holy Spirit directed us that way. The next passage is in John chapter 13, and I'm going to encourage you just to write that down and go read it sometime this week, because time's not going to let us do that today. But this passage of Scripture in John chapter 13, 
It talks about Jesus uh, washing his disciples' feet. He's in this setting. He's about to have the last meal with his disciples and and, uh, set up the ordinance of communion and all of those things. And he he breaks away, and and as they're coming, he has a water basin and begins to wash their feet. A couple things that I, I want us to note about that today is this. When you serve people, you serve people. It's not just serving people that treat you good. You don't just serve people that treat you good. We like to serve people that treat us fairly, right? Because it's easy. I'm looking around the room and the disciples as Jesus is washing their feet, and one of them's about to betray him. There's a guy by the name of Judas that's about to betray him. And Jesus models this act of serving and this great teaching that he uses as a model. He says, listen, it's not just about people who treat me fairly. God wants me to give, to love my enemies. He wants me to do good to everyone, to serve everyone, to love my neighbor. The other thing I noticed about this, you see, washing of feet was a common practice This wasn't anything new, but it was a job that was done for a slave. It was a job that was done for a servant. In Jesus' day, the modes of footwear were sandals or nothing. They didn't have Nikes. They didn't even have flip-flops. Sandals or nothing. And it was dusty. And as it was dusty, you know what happened? Your feet get dirty. They didn't have Velcro to keep them on. The buckle thing, isn't that nice? They didn't have those kind of luxuries. Your feet got dirty. And so when you would enter somebody's home, one of the first things that they would do is have a servant come and wash your feet so that you wouldn't get your stinky feet in their house. Because this is how they would eat dinner. If this is the dinner table, they would recline at the dinner table like this. I know some of you in the back can't see me. I'm still down here. (laughs) They would recline at the dinner table like this. And as they're reclining at the dinner table, what happens is their feet were sticking out. Nobody wants sticky, stinky feet in their food. Amen? So they would wash their feet when they came in but it was a servant that did it. Jesus in this is displaying that servanthood should be a daily practice of things that we should normally be doing. Did you catch that? Being a servant is a daily practice of things that we can do every day. We should be part of our normal life. You know what the opposite of serving is? Being selfish. The opposite of serving is selfish. So I challenge you. Watch your motives. Watch your attitudes. Watch your thoughts. Is it about you? Or is it about others? Is it about loving God with all your heart? Because I'll guarantee if you'll love God with all your heart, the other part will become more natural. You'll start to love people like you never loved people before. You know, we have four things, and they're in your bulletin, but they're also on the back wall. One of them says, love intensely. Those are things that we want to be about as a church. Loving intensely, loving God, and loving people. Two greatest commandments that Jesus gave. Loving God, loving people. The Bible says that. We want to give generously. We want to serve sacrificially. Because when you serve sacrificially, it's something that costs you something. Hallelujah. Last passage of scripture today, 1 Peter chapter 4. And as we read 1 Peter chapter 4, he begins to break down some things for us to give us some bullet points here. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. There's a connection, as we've mentioned today, there's a connection between love and serving. And it's found here as Peter begins to share this. Chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 7, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore be solemn and sober so you can pray. 
Above all things, have unfailing love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without complaining. As everyone has received a gift, even so serve one another with it as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone serves, let him serve with the strength that God supplies so that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom he prays be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. There's some things in here I, I want us to look at. Number one is this. He says to be alert. To be alert. He says be solemn and sober, looking for opportunities that you can serve others. Don't go through life with blinders on. I'm not a, I'm not a horse person. I'm barely an animal person. And one thing I do know, what they used to do with horses is they would put blinders on the horses. And the blinders would keep them focused on what was right ahead of them and let them see only what was ahead. They couldn't see what was around them, and it would keep them more focused on what the rider wanted them to do. There is a good spiritual connotation with that, that we focus our heart and our mind on Jesus and get rid of the distractions. And I get that. That's very much true. That's very much a part of our Christian walk, but I want to kind of change this thought process a little bit with that, is this, so many times we have blinders on, and we're only focused on our stuff. We're only focused on what we want, we're focused on our agenda, we're focused on my time, on my stuff, the things that I got to do, and what we do is we forget everybody else that's around, and so the person that you come in contact at your workplace, you're so busy because I've got deadlines and I got to get stuff done, and your person you're coming in contact with, man, that's the person God's trying to get your attention to speak into their heart to serve them in some capacity, to, to do something to reach out to them, but you're so consumed with your stuff that you've got these blinders on and you're not seeing the world around you. Does that make sense? To be sober and alert, to be able to be looking around and don't let things pass you by. The second thing he says this is prayer. He says to pray. Be sober and alert so you can pray. Why is prayer important? Because prayer opens our heart and our mind to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. It helps us to see the needs around us. Start every day with prayer. And pray for an opportunity for God to use you to touch other people. That it won't be about just you, but it will be an attitude of serving. The next one is this. Love each other deeply. Do you know it's hard to be selfish if you're thinking about other people? It's hard to be selfish when you're thinking about other people. That's true in your relationships. That's true in your marriages. That's true in everything, aspect of life like that. It is hard to be selfish if I'm thinking about it. I may not always get it right. My wife's not up here to say amen. I may not always get it right. But I promise you this, I will eventually get it right. Because I'm not thinking about me, I'm thinking about them. Love covers a multitude of sins. Have you ever found that it's easy to forgive when you love? It's easy to get out of, to get yourself out of the way and your feelings out of the way when you have that kind of compassion and it's reciprocated back to you. The next thing is this it says offer hospitality without complaining, without grumbling. Do things for people without complaining. Can you get me a drink of water? Get your own water. You know, I was sitting in, it was several years ago, my son was a teenager. We were sitting in the, in the family room of our house, and he was on one couch, I was on another, and he just was on his phone. So I thought, well, I'm going to get his attention. So I texted him. I said, hey, go get me something to drink. He texted back, go get it yourself. Grumbling and complaining. Arr, go get it yourself. Can you, can you do something for someone else without complaining about it? Do you have a let me help mentality? Doesn't it drive you nuts when people complain about helping you? Oh, my goodness. I'm not going there. 
we'll leave it at that. Finally, he says, use your gifts to, help, to serve others. Whatever you can do, do it to serve others. If you make cakes, make cakes for other people. Because you know what's going to happen if you just make them for yourself. If you can make cards, send them to other people. If you have a ministry gift, if you have something that you have to offer, use it to serve other people. God's given you talents and abilities and thought processes. All of us in this room are different. All of us have different likes and dislikes and, and things that we, we, we enjoy and things that we don't enjoy. And, and that's what makes us unique and part of this thing called the body of Christ. And, and we work together in that. And, and man, if you've got some talents and abilities and you're hoarding them to yourself, you're a selfish person. Oh man, I know. I've, I've, I've done, gone off the reservation today <laughs> on stepping on your toes. I just want to challenge you with that. Get out and help people. And we, we have ministries in this church that need people to serve in them. Thank God for the people that are working in children's ministry. Thank God for the people that are leading men's and women's ministries, that are doing couples, that are doing youth, that are doing all of these things. We thank God for those people. But when more people will join in and help, it lightens the load and it makes it more fluent. And then you know what happens? When you start integrating that, you grow, the ministry grows, everybody grows. Because that's God's plan. And so... We gave you a need this morning of children's ministry. We have a need downstairs for people to come alongside. We're not asking you to teach them a lesson. We're not asking you to swallow goldfish or stand on your head. That's what they did when I was in children's church. What we're asking you to do is love people. Can you do that? Can you love people? And we've got ministries of guys and, and we, people in our community that need stuff done to their home. Can you love people that you, can, you have the skill set to do that? We have ministry that takes place on Saturday morning. And, and thank God these guys, Mike and Pat, are doing a great job leading that. And they're calling on guys to share their faith and their testimony. I enjoy that. You know why? Because it gets you in a place where you're sharing and you're participating. It's not just about coming and getting fed both physically and spiritually. It's something that says, I am going to give, not just get. Man, and do you do things in women's ministry? Can you, can you cook? Can you... Uh, pray? Can you, can you intercede for someone? Can you do great things in ministry? Can, are there skill sets that you have? Are you a marketing person? Are you good with the computer? Do you fold papers well? I don't know. There's all kinds of different things that you could do, not just for the church, but for the body and the kingdom of God. And I, my question here today is this, are you using your gifts and your talents for what he's called you to do? And if you're not, if you're not, I want to challenge you. There might be an attitude adjustment that you need to make in your life and in your heart. Because chances are, no matter where that is to serve, if you're not doing anything servanthood-wise, you've got blinders on. And you are not thinking kingdom mindset. Because Jesus, if I'm going to model him, he says that he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life. Father, today I pray, help us, God, this morning. Help us, God, today. God, we've got to get rid of the consumer-based mindset. Help us, Lord, this morning. You're here this morning, and I know this is a tough ask, and I, I know that this is a tough thing, but I, I'm not really asking you to be honest with me. I'm asking you more to be honest with the Holy Spirit. And you would say something like this, man, in my life, and, and, I, and I'm praying that the Holy Spirit's doing something right now in you, and he's tugging at you a little bit. 
Because really, it's just been about showing up, coming to church, leaving, not doing anything for the kingdom all week long. I just come in here, I'm just eating and eating and eating and eating, and nothing's been put out. And whether you serve at your workplace or in your family or whatever the case may be, you've kind of just got this consumer-based thought process coming along. And can I tell you, as the body of Christ grows here at Bisville Assembly, which we are, we need people. We need you. That's what being part of this body is all about. It's not serving just for the body's sake, but it's serving God. It's doing what God's called you to do what he's gifted you to do and using it for his glory. Today you'd say, you know what? I need to reevaluate that in my life. There are things that I can do that I'm not doing. I'm not trying to coerce. I'm not trying to pull. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. The thought process for me is letting the Holy Spirit speak to you about this. Because it is a spiritual discipline. It is a spiritual discipline. The Dead Sea is dead because it has no outflow. It only has inflow. Eventually, all of that inflow will turn on you and you will end up being dead spiritually if you don't have any kind of outflow for it. If you're not willing to serve the Lord in some capacity. You can follow that box. You can be in the presence of God and you can follow Him until uh, come to church, but eventually what will happen is that box, that presence of God in your life will lead you to the place where you will want to serve. Because that's the heartbeat of God. And if you're going to have the heartbeat of God, that's the part of it. So this morning you say, Pastor, you know what, I'm... I'm in a place right now, I, I'm, I want to reevaluate this in my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and you say, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, and you want to say, God, I'm willing, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to see the kingdom of God advance. I'm willing to serve God. If that's you, I've got my eyes closed too, so here this morning, if that's you, I want you just to lift your hand to the Lord. Say, God, that's me. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing, God. Whatever it takes, God, I'm willing. If you call me, I'll go. I'll serve. Hallelujah. Maybe you're here today and you see the first step of all of that was the rich young ruler we talked about. He had to get his eyes off of his stuff and get his eyes onto Jesus and come completely to him. And maybe you're here today and you've not made that complete jump in with God to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But today, you say, you know what, Pastor, I, I want to make that step today. I want to be all in in worshiping Jesus and making him the Lord of my life. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand? We want to pray with you today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I want to make him the Lord of my life. Is there anyone else today? Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to do two prayers. Do the first one. I want you to pray with me. The second one, I I just, I'm going to let you pour out your own heart to God on the second one. But the first one, I want you to pray with me. It's a prayer of just allowing Jesus into our heart full time. Dear Jesus, I invite you in. I want you to be the ruler of my heart. I give you my heart, I give you my life, I give you everything. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me so I could have a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And we're gonna pray, and I want you to just pour out your heart to the Lord today. As I pray, I want you to pray with, Lord, I thank you, God, for folks that are willing that love you. And God, if they love you, they're, they're, they're wanting to get closer to you and love people and willing to serve. God, that we've been called to serve. That's the thing that you've asked us to do, to give our life to you. We're not giving our life for a cause. We're giving our life to the King. And so God, today, I, I pray, help us, Lord, 
that we would submit our talents, our abilities, that we would submit our heart and our mindsets, God, to you. And if there's things in our life that we need to readjust, if there's schedules and calendars we need to readjust, if there's things that we need to do differently, whatever the case is, God, I pray today that you would speak to us and, Lord, that we would be willing to just step out and say, God, I'm willing to change it. I'm taking off the blinders. I'm going to see the need around me. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. I want to serve, God. I want to serve. I want to serve you and I want to serve others. God, that's what this is all about. It's what you've called us to do. I thank you, God, for that privilege. Now, God, as we leave here today, I pray, give us divine appointments and opportunities. Holy Spirit, speak to our heart about what you would have us to do. We've heard a message today from your word. Help us to respond to it this week, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.